Welcome to part five of Chinese religion. This video provides an introduction to the history of early Taoism in the Warring States period. We're going to begin with looking at some of the main philosophical influences on Taoism. Taoism or Tao Jia did not actually start as a coherent single school of thought, unlike Confucianism. You can trace Confucianism and Moism back to the teachings of their founder, Confucius and Mo Tse, respectively. Taoism did not have a single founder. Um, it did have some philosophical antecedents. One of them is another school of thought called Yang Jia, which literally is the school or the house of Yang. This is named after Yang Chu, who was a scholar during the Warring States period. His philosophy was to preserve your own life through avoiding political office and through cultivating your health. His philosophy um, is often interpreted nowadays in terms of ethical egoism, which is the ethical theory that says the right action is the one that maximizes your long-term self-interest or well-being. This definitely seems to fit Yang Chu's view which is another reason why it's called individualism. Ethical hedonism is also often used to interpret Yang Chu's philosophy. Hedonism is the belief that, um, or ethical hedonism is the belief that the good, what should be pursued in life, is getting pleasure and avoiding pain. So pain is the bad, ethically speaking, and pleasure is the good. And Yang Chu may indeed have believed this. He does seem to think that it's best to take care of your bodily health over the long run. So this can involve foregoing pleasures in the short run um, if that would contribute to your health. Um, so even though Taoism is not an egoist or a hedonist school of thought, Yang Jia did have some influence on Taoism. The idea of cultivating yourself for the sake of health and longevity is a very strong theme in Taoism. And the idea that political office, even though it's conventionally regarded as a great thing, if you attain a high position in government, you've accomplished one of the main goals most scholars would have set out to in ancient China. Um, and just conventional society will praise you for having power and status and wealth but Yang Chu is saying you should actually avoid that because it will not actually contribute to your long-term physical well-being and you might pause for a moment and think about why that might be the case well you could make a general argument that caring so much worrying so much about trying to accomplish um, a high position in society will naturally tend to wear you down, both mentally and physically. However, I think that was even more salient during the Warring States period, when there was a lot of conflict both within and between the states or kingdoms of China. There were many assassinations of rivals. If you were politically unpopular, if you had a political enemy, they might be able to cause you to be imprisoned or mutilated or even killed. So there was a literal sense in which the life of ambition, especially trying to get a high rank in a government, could literally threaten your life. Another important early influence on Taoism is Nong Jia, or the school of the farmer. So these people were scholars who decided that it's a better life to live simply as a farmer in the countryside rather than to have a grand ambition to rise in status in the government. You can see a common theme there with Yang Chu's philosophy. These schools of thought are both appealing to the educated class. So this is a tiny percentage of the society who would have been literate scholars. And also they both kind of appeal to people who are not of noble birth themselves primarily because these are the sort of people who would ordinarily be using their education as a lever to increase their social status. The difference between Yang Jia and Nong Jia is Nong Jia 
um, is first of all not explicitly advocating egoism and secondly they have a more specific idea of how to have a good life it's not just to take care of your body and health wherever you may be it's to leave the city leave the capital retire to a country life and we know that this school of thought existed before Taoism because there are records of Confucius having dialogues with people who seem to fit this ideology you can find them in Confucius's text the Lun Yu or the Analects as it's called in English where he's um, talking to scholars who are educated they know music they can quote the classics but they've chosen to live a simple life in the country and he seems to think that they've made an error that from the Confucian perspective um, part of being human is having culture and being a part of civilization um, the influence on Taoism of this school is the idea that the simpler life is better and you should abandon your ambition for power wealth and status it's better to live closer to nature to maybe be a farmer or a gardener or even to forage in the wilderness um, even though the idea of the way of nature may not be explicit in the thought of Nong Jia the fact that they're advocating living what you might say closer to nature may have had an influence on Taoism now it's important to not have the misconception that everyone who identified as a Taoist scholar was going to just become a recluse in the wilderness some did in fact but they did take that as a kind of ideal or at least as a kind of illustration of a life more in harmony with the Tao so this school seems to have been an influence on them as well there's also another school that started in the Warring States period called Huang Lao Jia and this has a different name from Taoism Dao Jia but you can look at it as just an early form of Taoism so Huang Lao Jia is named after the Yellow Emperor Huang Di who is one of the early legendary rulers of China and Lao Tzu the legendary author of the Tao Te Ching Huang Lao Jia though actually its teachings differ subtly from those of the earliest texts that are identified as Taoist or Tao Jia that's the Tao Te Ching and the Chuang Tzu we're going to be talking about their teachings in just a minute so even though these two different strands of Taoism you might say did eventually become combined um, there is a subtle way of distinguishing them so the Huang Lao texts they focus on metaphysics and cosmology based on yin yang theory and wu xing or five elements theory and they often give particular advice for rulers um, they're supposedly based on the teachings of Huang Di and Lao Tzu but if you read the Huang Lao texts they'll include things like what colors the ruler should wear in different times of the year so it's very specific advice on how to utilize the play of yin and yang and the elements in nature over time to maximize the success or efficacy of the ruler um, and you can see there is a little bit of cosmology and metaphysics that happens in the Tao Te Ching but it tends to be vaguer and less explicit than what you see in the Huang Lao texts also in the Tao Te Ching there is some advice given for rulers but it's not that specific as to you know what colors you should be wearing how you should be traveling etc it's more of a broader philosophical viewpoint being offered so um, there are some early Huang Lao texts that have survived an example is the so-called Huang Lao silk manuscripts that date to the second century BC they may represent the continuation of an older tradition though so uh, in these manuscripts Lao Tzu is presented as a sage who kind of governs the world through Wu Wei or non-action this is a concept that occurs in the Tao Te Ching as well Wu Wei but Lao Tzu is not portrayed there as a ruling sage uh, more just as a scholar even though you know his exact status isn't really explained in the Tao Te Ching but if you read it it does give advice for rulers 
it doesn't have a specific image of Lao Tzu himself as a, a sage king or a ruler. Also in the Huang Lao manuscripts, we see an early version of this teaching that was important for both later Taoism and Confucianism of this cosmic trinity formed between heaven, earth, and human beings. Heaven is the symbol of yang energy. Earth is the symbol of yin imagery, not just the symbol, but the embodiment of it. And the idea is an enlightened human being, a sage, can sort of complete this cosmic trinity and serve as a kind of bridge between heaven and earth, linking and harmonizing the two. So the sage, and ideally a sage ruler, is someone who can perform this cosmic function. Also in the Huang Lao Silk Manuscripts, we do get an early detailed version of what's called sometimes microcosm and macrocosm theory. This is one way of describing the system of correspondences, illustrating how features in an individual mind or body, like your organs, for example, correspond to things in the wider world, the elements, the seasons, the directions, etc. And so a change in one may affect a change in the other. This sort of thinking, you don't see it, at least not explicitly in Tao Te Ching or the Chuang Tzu, but it would eventually be combined with Taoist philosophy. So Huang Lao Jia died out as a separate school after Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty made Confucianism the state religion in the second century BC. This is kind of a conventional way of expressing the idea that Emperor Wu of Han was giving support to Confucian scholars and ritual experts. However, the ideas of Huang Lao did ultimately get integrated into Confucianism, Taoism, and just kind of like traditional Chinese religion and philosophy generally. So let's look at the Tao Te Ching, which is often regarded as the oldest or original Taoist text. Um, it probably dates from the 4th century BC or maybe after. And so there's a possibility that actually the Chuang Tzu is older than the Tao Te Ching. The Chuang Tzu is more probably linked to the 4th century, but it's possible the Tao Te Ching was put together in the 3rd century. Also, we have different versions of the text. There's a standard version, the received text, that's been passed along for the last couple thousand years or so. But if you go back um, before that, there are variant versions of the text. And so it took several centuries for it to be kind of solidified. It does not seem to have a single author, according to modern scholars. Now, traditionally, Lao Tzu, which literally means the old master, is regarded as the author of the Tao Te Ching. But many modern scholars think that was a kind of literary device um, and that it's actually an anthology of separately authored verses, proverbs, short sayings related to the Tao, which is the way, and its power or da. So the literal meaning of the name of the text is way power book. It's the classic or book about the Tao and its power. Um, and so even though it may not have had a single author, definitely the ideas in it are congruent with each other. Um, so what probably happened is there was a group of scholars who were thinking along similar lines, producing short proverbs or poems on similar themes, and they were collected together in this anthology. On the right is a traditional way of depicting Lao Tzu, though. Um, so what you see in the Tao Te Ching, one of the main themes is it's opposition to Confucianism. This is actually a clue that the Tao Te Ching was created after the time of Confucius, or at least in response to Confucius. Traditionally in China, Lao Tzu, the author of the Tao Te Ching, is regarded as an older contemporary of Confucius. There are later histories that report dialogues of them where the Lao Tzu is trying to argue with Confucius or teach him some point. Um, and so this would imply that if Lao Tzu was older than Confucius, then he probably wrote the Tao Te Ching before Confucius authored his texts. However, um, if you look at the text itself, it makes more sense to say, okay, this came after Confucianism because it seems to be a self-conscious reaction to Confucianism. So unlike Confucianism, which idealizes human customs and culture, the Tao Te Ching is skeptical about the value of those and advocates returning to what you might call the way of nature or a kind of cosmic uh, 
universal reality that's outside of human custom and culture. Um, the Tao Te Ching also criticizes Confucian virtues and Confucian learning as a kind of imitation or display or something that's not ultimately sincere. There's an idea in the Tao Te Ching that if you try to cultivate virtue or learning in an overly deliberate or self-conscious way, you'll just create an imitation of authentic virtue, not the real thing. Real virtue has to come from a kind of intuitive depth that can't be deliberately brought about. And there's a theme of being against learning in general. And now the people who wrote the Tao Te Ching and the people who read it and studied it and took it seriously, they were scholars for the most part. So you can't take this too literally. But the idea is that if you're just focusing on learning and thinking that from that you can train or cultivate your character, that's the Confucian idea. The Tao Te Ching really rejects that. And it's implying that learning, if pursued in the wrong way at the very least, can take you away from the natural spontaneous virtue. So there's a kind of intuitive, spontaneous way of being in harmony with the Tao, the way of the cosmos that you need to discover. And it, it kind of sketches some ways of doing that. There's some passages that may suggest a, a kind of basic meditative practice, but it's basically just illustrating through um, metaphor, through analogy, the type of mind state you have to have in order to be in harmony spontaneously with the way. So the Tao Te Ching has a lot of passages about the Tao. And it's using the word Tao to refer not to the way of the former kings, as it's often referred to in Confucianism. That would be a human custom or culture, but rather the way of nature or the way of the universe. The Tao in the very beginning, the first chapter of Tao Te Ching, is characterized as not being explainable or statable by human concepts. So one translation of this is a way that can be followed is not a constant way. And a name that can be named is not a constant or eternal name. So there's this idea that the way or the Tao, if you name it, you've kind of missed the eternal, the true or the underlying way of things. So this concept is called Wu Ming, or without lacking a name. Um, you also see some basic cosmology or metaphysics in the Tao Te Ching. The Tao is portrayed as being the ultimate source or origin of both yin and yang, and also of the various things you perceive with your senses. These are customarily referred to as the 10,000 things. It's not the literal number 10,000, that's just an arbitrarily large number to refer to the great variety of sensory experiences we have and the objects of those experiences. So from chapter one, here's a passage that illustrates that. Nameless, it is the beginning of heaven and earth. Named, it is the mother of the 10,000 things. So there's this idea that the nameless Tao, the Tao without description is the source of heaven and earth. Heaven is the ultimate yang, earth is the ultimate yin. And then it says named, it is the mother of the 10,000 things. So the idea is if you do put a kind of label or a form on the Tao, that's how it becomes all of the sensory phenomena. Um, there's also a tendency in the Tao Te Ching to use yin imagery to symbolize the Tao. And this is so, even though strictly speaking, it's supposed to be beyond yin and yang. It's prior to them. And yet the Tao Te Ching uses yin imagery exclusively to represent the Tao. It's called the mother, the mysterious female, the valley spirit. It occupies the low position. So the main reason for this is that even though the Tao is not purely yin, it's the source of both yin and yang, like yin, it tends to be shadowy and mysterious. Um, and because it's not directly observable through the senses, it's not even directly thinkable with the rational mind. Also, um, yin is associated with the female and like females, which can give birth, 
the Tao is regarded as a creative source of things. Um, one illustration of the nameless aspect of the Tao is Wu Ji. This term is actually used in the Tao Te Ching in chapter 28. Um, it basically means that which has no limit is infinite. Um, in later Taoist cosmology, it would be used as a symbol of the emptiness, the unlimited state of affairs that was at the beginning, the very beginning of the world. And it's symbolized by just an empty circle. Um, but that can be used as a kind of symbol for the unmanifest Tao itself. So the Tao is this kind of empty vessel, this empty source that has pure potential. And then it gives rise to yin and yang and then to other things. There is um, a practical application of this metaphysics and cosmology to human life. The Tao Te Ching talks about how sages or supremely wise people live in the world based on their harmony with the Tao, you might say. So one concept is emptiness or Shu. A sage empties their mind of excessive thought and desire. You can see this referred to even in chapter one in addition to other chapters. So in chapter one, it says, always eliminate desires in order to observe its mysteries. That is the mysteries of the Tao. So there's this idea that desires and also excessive thoughts can kind of cloud the mind. Now, the Tao Te Ching uh, tends to resist absolutes. So it doesn't seem to say that you should never have desires. Um, the very next line after the one I read is, always have desires in order to observe its manifestations. So desiring will alert you to the manifestations of the Tao in what you might call the literal, physical, or concrete world. Whereas if you're also able to have that desireless state, you can get in harmony with the Tao. So there might be a kind of idea that the sage occupies a superposition, to use a metaphor from quantum mechanics, where you're neither strictly desireless nor strictly desiring, but you can kind of go back and forth between those as needed. So there's this idea of underlying flexibility. And the idea of flexibility and being able to bend is a very strong theme in the Tao. So the sage would bend without breaking, whereas a more rigid person, they could be blown by the wind or a strong force and they would break like um, a harder stick, for example. Um, another concept in the Tao Te Ching is Wu Wei, which means not doing or non-action. And there are different interpretations of this, um, but it's probably safe to say it does not literally mean not doing anything is the way to go. It rather seems to refer to a way of acting that's in harmony with the Tao. And you don't have to force it or think about it too much. That's why it feels like not doing anything. It happens naturally, effortlessly, spontaneously. This is often compared to the flow state that's been studied by modern psychologists, where a person who is very focused on what they're doing and they're meeting a challenge, but the challenge is not overwhelming them, it's at the right level, they can get in this kind of very smooth flowing state where they perform very well, perhaps even optimally. Um, that seems to be the kind of idea that's suggested by Wu Wei. The sage is not described as being very selfish or only thinking about themselves. There's an idea in which they're benefiting from their emptiness and from their Wu Wei, but they're not clinging to things. They're not possessing things. So in chapter two, for example, it says, they, that's the sages, work with the 10,000 things and turn none away. They produce without possessing. They act with no expectation of reward. When their work is done, they do not linger. And by not lingering, merit never deserts them. So there's this idea that the sage does act in a way that people might benefit, but they're not sort of um, waiting for praise. They're not clinging to that. They're not looking for any um, kind of acknowledgement. It just happens naturally. Um, the term Wu Ji, where it appears in the Tao Te Ching is in chapter 28 where the sage is regarded as someone who can return to that infinite or limitless source of things, the Wu Ji. Uh, and this theme would later be expanded on in much more detail by Taoist cosmology, both philosophical and religious, you could say, in later centuries. But the idea is present of a kind of 
merging with the source of things in the Tao Te Ching. The painting on the right is another traditional depiction of Lao Tzu riding the back of an ox. And traditionally, he's regarded as having ridden the ox to the western border of China. He was sort of disgusted with the state of affairs during that chaotic uh, Eastern Chou dynasty, and he just wanted to leave society, you might say. Um, however, the western border was guarded by someone who stopped him and asked basically for a summary of his wisdom. So that's when, according to tradition, he wrote the Tao Te Ching just right there, left the text with the gatekeeper, and then continued his way on to the west. Uh, one way of interpreting the riding the ox symbol is the ox is a symbol for the kind of dynamic, uh, potentially harmful, but potentially useful um, energies of nature. And so Lao Tzu has tamed the ox. Um, he's gotten mastery of it. He can ride it around as he pleases. So the other really important ancient um, Taoist text that's at the start of Tao Jia or Taoism is the Chuang Tzu. Chuang Tzu is both the name of the text and the name of the author. The author is Chuang Cho. He was a scholar who lived during the reign of King Wei of Chu. So we do believe that Chuang Cho was a historical person. According to tradition, he left his government position to pursue a private life of reflection and writing. And that may have been when he composed the Chuang Tzu. Now, not all of the text known as Chuang Tzu is believed to be written by Chuang Cho himself. There's a distinction that goes back to ancient times of the inner chapters, the outer chapters, and the miscellaneous chapters. The inner chapters one to seven are believed to have been probably written by Chuang Cho himself. The outer chapters um, are believed to be written by followers of his. They really seem to express mostly his views. They're sometimes called the, the school of Chuang. Um, and then there's some later chapters, even later in the text, that do reflect ideas of other schools of thought, such as uh, Yang Jia, for example, or Nong Jia, not just the, the thought of Chuang Cho himself. But they're a very useful source of additional information about the warring states philosophy in China. Um, so one thing to know about the Chuang Tzu is it does have a very different style and tone in certain ways from the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching uh, is different from texts like the Analects of Confucius in that it is not very literal, direct to the point. It does not record dialogues between people. You could say in that sense, there's a kind of informal aspect to it or a poetic rather aspect to it um, that you can find something like that in the Chuang Tzu. But the Chuang Tzu doesn't just give sort of um, poetic metaphors or vague suggestive allusions. Instead, it gives more concrete fables and stories. These also serve though to indirectly suggest the meaning of the text. Um, the tone also is distinct. It's very playful and irreverent. So this is very different from that of most other texts from the uh, Warring States period, at least philosophical texts. Um, on the right is a painting of Chuang Tzu asleep and presumably dreaming. This is a traditional theme. It's very popular in traditional Chinese painting and also a subject in other East Asian painting um, that's been influenced by Chinese culture. So this is a reference to a story in the end of chapter two where Chuang Tzu is depicted as asleep and dreaming and he's not sure when he wakes up if he was Chuang Tzu dreaming he was a butterfly or a butterfly now dreaming that he's Chuang Tzu. So I'll actually read out this passage of the text just to illustrate it. Once I, Chuang Cho, dreamt that I was a butterfly, fluttering about happily. I did not know that I was Cho. Suddenly I awoke, and there I was, Cho again. I did not know whether it was Cho dreaming that he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming that it was Cho. Between Cho and a butterfly, there must be a distinction. This is called the transformation of things. So there's a lot going on in this passage. This is very characteristic of the Chuang Tzu. The passages are short, kind of punchy or pithy. They may seem kind of simplistic, but they tend to reward further thought. There's a lot of ways of interpreting this, a lot of things that it might be saying. I mean, one interpretation is just that, well, there's no way of knowing 
um, whether he's the butterfly or Chuang Tzu. I mean, you could go that way, but it also seems to be just reflective of the general idea of Chuang Tzu to kind of question the rigidity or fixed way we tend to hold our perspectives, to kind of loosen things up, to see things in a more open, creative, and intuitive way. He also makes a kind of philosophical claim at the end where he says, between Cho and the butterfly, there must be a distinction. This is called the transformation of things. So he's saying, look, we do have a meaningful distinction between Chuang Cho and the butterfly. It's not like they're the same thing. And yet one seems to be changing into the other. So this could be making some point about the reality of difference, but also the reality of transformation. One thing changes into another. So a very influential figure in the life of Chuang Tzu was another scholar, Hui Tzu. He's actually referred to many times in the Chuang Tzu. This was apparently a friend of Chuang Tzu's, or at least a frequent associate and partner in philosophical dialogue. Hui Tzu or Hui Shi is regarded as an important scholar in another school of thought called Ming Jia, or the school of names. This is a school of thought that was focused on what would nowadays be called philosophy of language, logic, and epistemology, or theory of knowledge. Um, so this is a different set of questions than we've seen so far. We've tended to focus on the ethical schools. Those are the ones that had the biggest impact on Chinese religion. Mo Tzu, Confucius, Taoism, um, Taoist philosophy. But there were other schools of thought as well that were focused on more purely philosophical, you might say, topics, not uh, epistemology and metaphysics as opposed to ethics. And Ming Jia was one example. So Hui Tzu had a great reputation as a master of bian, which means disputation or logical argumentation. So he was very skillful at making inferences and drawing distinctions, but he and other members of his school often did so in paradoxical, counterintuitive ways that seemed to call into a question our basic assumptions. One example, a famous saying of the school is that a white horse is not a horse. And this apparently seems to be a reference to the fact that when you add the predicate white to the predicate horse, it's a different thing. So you could say that logically speaking, the expression white horse is not equivalent in meaning to horse, but this was somehow used as the source of an apparent paradox because ordinarily we regard white horses as a subset of horses, but maybe it was trying to play upon the ambiguity between saying that white horse is logically distinct from horse versus white horse is a member of the set of horses or a subset of the set of horses. These are the types of things that um, really you could probably only solve formally using modern predicate logic. So it's, it's not like this was just a waste of time, even though it kind of went in weird directions. An example from Hui Tzu himself is a list of paradoxes. These are actually given at the end of the miscellaneous chapters of the Chuang Tzu. And we don't know exactly what all the paradoxes mean, but the purpose of them seems to have been to call into question our rational ability to make distinctions between things. So one example that is relatively clear in meaning, what has no thickness cannot be piled up, and yet it extends for a thousand miles. This seems to be a reference to a paradox of infinite sums. So the idea is that a distance of a thousand miles seemingly can be divided infinitely. There's no end to the amount of times you can divide that. And you can start what you might say, um, the smallest possible division of it would be something that has no thickness. Um, and so you might think if something has no thickness, this would be a mathematical point actually. So you can define that very precisely mathematically. You might think no matter how many points you have, they will never add up to a distance of a thousand miles or even one mile or any finite distance. And this is actually false, mathematically speaking. Um, it's actually the case if you have a distance such as in, you know, it doesn't matter what uh, dimensional space it is, but any dimensional space, if there's a distance in there, one dimensional or higher space, 
that can be decomposed into an infinite number of points that have no distance or no extension. Um, this fact, though, wasn't really proven or discovered until the 19th century, where um, people were working on the mathematics of infinity, the theory of infinite sums. And so you couldn't really prove this fact until modern times. The point is, there's actually a really deep mathematical point being made here by Hui Tse, but he just tries to take it in a kind of extreme direction that's probably not really justified. So it turns out that if you have a infinity, an infinity of what's called cardinality C, this infinity will uh, be added up to a finite distance. So there's different types of infinity that have different sizes or cardinalities. Um, however, he tried to use this paradox to prove that therefore it's meaningless to talk of differences because it's uh, distances rather, because it seems to lead to contradictions. There is no thickness, there's a thousand miles thickness. How could these things relate to each other? The idea here, just to clarify, is that if you have a point of zero distance, zero thickness, if you keep on adding to that point, you will still never get to a thousand miles. You'll just have zero. Um, and so he has a whole list of these paradoxes, but he tries to use these to conclude, therefore, you can't make any distinctions between things. Therefore, there's only one fundamental being. This is called monism in philosophy. It's the doctrine that there's only one fundamental being or reality. And he drew a further ethical implication of this because all beings are one, therefore you should love all beings equally. So you might call this an ethic of impartial benevolence for all things. It's kind of similar to Moism, but even more extreme. So Moza had just said you should love all people equally or care about all people equally. This is saying you should love all things equally, whether human, non-human, whether living, non-living. So it's quite an extreme doctrine. Um, the picture on the right is an illustration of Chuang Tzu and Hui Tzu debating whether fishes can enjoy themselves. This refers to a passage in chapter 17 of the Chuang Tzu. What's interesting about Hui Tzu is he definitely had an influence on the thinking of Chuang Tzu. You can even look at Chuang Tzu's text as a reaction against Hui Tzu. So he ends up agreeing that there is a kind of harmony or unity to things, but it's not absolute. And also he thinks that um, Hui Tzu has too much faith in logic so that he thinks he's proving things logically, um, but the arguments don't actually work. If you poke at them a bit more, you should be more skeptical even about our belief in these paradoxes. So here's the passage from chapter 17 where we get the story of the fishes. Chuang Tzu and Hui Tzu were walking along the dam of the Hao River when Chuang Tzu said, how, were, how the fish come to play, that is how the fish enjoy themselves. Hui Tzu said, you are not a fish. How do you know what fish enjoy? Chuang Tzu replied, you are not I. How do you know that I do not know what fish enjoy? Hui Tzu said, I am not you, and granted that I do not fully know you. You certainly are not a fish. That proves that you do not know what fish really enjoy. Chuang Tzu replied, let us return to your original question. You said to me, how do you know what fish enjoy? So you already knew that I knew it when you asked the question. I know the enjoyment of the fish from my enjoyment of wandering along the Hao River. So once again, that's a passage that could be rich in interpretation. A lot of actually complicated philosophical questions are just being alluded to. Things about epistemology, theory of knowledge, what is the basis for your judgments of things? So Hui Tzu is trying to give a skeptical argument to Chuang Tzu that he can't know what the fish is experiencing. And um, Chuang Tzu's counter is basically, his ultimate counter is that, well, if it's impossible for me to know what the fish is experiencing, then that is a very high level of knowledge, you, a standard for what counts as knowledge. You wouldn't even be able to know what I am saying to you or that I claim that I know what the fish is feeling. That's one way of interpreting the passage anyway. And Chuang Tzu's answer is that basically he's appealing to some kind of intuitive experience. Just as I have this intuitive, immediate awareness of my own experience, 
I can get a sense of what it's like for the fish, even if it's not quite the same. I can make conclusions, draw inferences intuitively, you might say, about what the fish is experiencing. So it, it's this kind of like faith of Chuang Tzu that on the one hand, we have to be skeptical of rational argumentation. On the other hand, there's an intuitive felt experience that can give us insight not only to our own life, but potentially the experiences of other beings as well. And this relates to their dialogue because when they're talking, each one is presuming they can have some understanding of what the other person is claiming and thus what the other person is experiencing. So one of the main themes of the Chuang Tzu is that of relativity of perspective. Different creatures, different people have different points of view and each one is kind of stuck in their perspective. So one example of this is the butterfly dream. So there's one perspective in which Chuang Cho is dreaming of the butterfly. The other perspective is that the butterfly is dreaming of Chuang Cho, which is real, the alleged dream or the alleged waking life. Another example occurs at the very beginning of the Chuang Tzu, chapter one, where Chuang Tzu gives a kind of parable or a, a legend of this gigantic fish called Kun that is able to transform into a gigantic bird called Peng. And this bird is so large, when it flies through the sky, its wings cast a shadow on all below. And towards the end of this passage, there's some smaller birds that are kind of making fun of the Peng, saying, what are you doing? You're crazy, you're flying so high, what's this all about? Um, and they're kind of saying like, he's just some sort of crazy high-flying person. He's not down to earth, you might say, metaphorically. And the purpose of this passage, though, um, can be interpreted as there's no right point of view. The Peng bird has his perspective, which makes sense to him. The smaller birds have their perspective, which makes sense to them. Who's to say who is right? You could also try to maybe get some evidence for that interpretation. If you look at Chuang Tzu's criticisms of the Confucians and the Moists, and many passages of the Chuang Tzu, He's critiquing Confucian's and Moist's attempt to describe reality as this way or as that way. He says the Confucian's yes is the Moist's no and vice versa. So he's basically saying that we should be skeptical about all of their claims to knowledge. And these types of passages might suggest a view called relativism. I mean, the second one could suggest skepticism, but they also could suggest a relativist interpretation, which is that um, it's not just that we can't get knowledge of objective truth, it's that there is no objective truth. Relativism is the view that truth is based on a person's perspective, which could include their beliefs, their perceptions, their feelings, or what have you, their values. Objectivism is the view that truth is not relative to a person's perspective and is the same for everyone, regardless of what they think, perceive, feel, or value. Um, and Many times, uh, Chuang Tzu is interpreted as a relativist, but I do think this is misleading. Um, even if you look at that first story of the Kun fish and the Peng bird, the Peng bird is portrayed as this more majestic, mighty being that has the larger perspective. When the Peng bird flies, it's able to see the entire world, essentially, whereas the smaller birds down below are petty and they're making fun of and not understanding the larger perspective of the Peng bird just because they can't fly as high. And so the Peng bird is probably a symbol of the human sage who's able to take this larger cosmic perspective and other people, they have this smaller, narrower perspective and they won't even understand that the sage has accomplished something. They'll probably just make fun of the sage. So let's talk a bit more about sages in the Chuang Tzu. A term used by the Chuang Tzu for a sage is Chen Ren, which means true person. So the idea is they're an authentic human being. Like in the story of the Peng bird, they're able to attain a higher or broader perspective that takes more into account and is superior to that of a smaller, narrower perspective. The, pers the sage's perspective, though, is not something they can spell out with verbal teachings. So this illustrates the contrast between Chuang Tzu and Confucius and Moza. The idea is the sage has a kind of intuitive knowledge. It's one also that's based on context. So they can't just give a list of virtues that are gonna be right in all situations. 
It's something that you have to kind of know intuitively based on what you're perceiving and feeling in a given case. So there's also the concept of shu or emptiness. And this in the Chuang Tzu seems to refer to being empty of inauthentic thoughts or desires. So kind of a similar theme to the Tao Te Ching. It's probably one of the reasons why these texts, even though they were authored separately, they were later grouped together as being part of the same school of thought. The sage attains a kind of oneness or harmony with all things through emptying their mind of excessive thought and desire. There's also a concept of who, which can be translated as change or transformation. The sage is someone who understands the fundamental truth of change or transformation in things, understands it as a kind of fate or inevitability, and is able to live in harmony with that, even embrace that. One extreme example of this is the story of Chuang Tzu drumming on a tub and singing when his wife dies. And no, he's not doing this because he's happy that the old witch has finally croaked. It's nothing like that. He actually says, I was mourning very severely. I was grieving at first. But then I realized just the nature of things is transformation and death is part of that. So there was a time when my wife didn't have a body. There was a time when she didn't even have a spirit. And there's this change in nature in which the spirit will form, the body will form, the body will go away, the spirit will go away. And just as I shouldn't mourn the time before my wife was here, there's something unreasonable about mourning the time after she's here. So he's able to kind of understand and ultimately accept these changes in nature. And that's a kind of very uh, Taoist perspective that have, a, have an influence on later Taoism. There's also a concept of spontaneity or tzi ran, which can be translated as so of itself, self so. Um, and this can refer to a state of being of a sage or a wise person. The sage is able to exist without force, deliberation, or excess selfish desire. So there's a story that illustrates this of a very skilled butcher named Cook Ding who's in the service of King Hui of Wei. And the butcher is very skilled in his butchering as the king notices, so he asks him how he got so skillful, what's kind of his secret, and ultimately about how he lives his life. And the butcher or the cook explains that he's honed his craft over years or decades of practice. And at first he was chopping clumsily, but he eventually became very perceptive of the subtle differences in the muscle, the tendons, the bones of the carcasses he's butchering. And now he's able to butcher them so efficiently that he doesn't even have to sharpen his knife because he goes where there's no resistance. And then after, he, he actually explains more than that too, but after the king hears his explanation, he praises the cook for giving him insight on how to nurture his life or nurture his vitality. Um, the idea of nurturing life would become a very important theme in Taoism as well, that you want to protect and nourish the vital energies of your body and mind by your way of life. And what's interesting here is the idea of nurturing your life through relying upon very careful perception. So it's not just going naively with the flow of your inner impulse alone. You're using intuition in conjunction with what you're perceiving with your senses and you've actually honed your mind so you can perceive very subtle differences in this subtle differences in the carcass he's butchering you could argue the carcass is a metaphor for the world as a whole which has differences in its material structure in different places and so how you interact with it is going to have to be very sensitive to those material differences what would later be called the fundamental principle of reality this term was actually taken up by later Confucians and others to refer to a kind of matrix or order that's out there that you have to perceive with your, your senses and kind of with your intuition. So finally, we should talk about this concept of inward training, which there were some texts developing this Taoist concept in the Warring States period. And these had a big influence on later understandings in Taoism. So inward training is a, transfer, a translation of ne yan, which literally ne is inward or inner. 
and Jan is training. There are two early texts um, called the Inward Training and the Techniques of the Mind One that are found in another longer text, the Guanzhou, which is actually an anthology or compilation of texts. And these were known about since ancient times, but they were kind of rediscovered in terms of their significance by modern scholars because the Guanzhou as a whole was not classified as a Taoist text, but it does have these kind of um, Taoist parts or chapters to it. So inward training in general is about how to cultivate your shin or heart mind using meditation and other self-cultivation practices. And we know from texts like these and others that these were things done by the early Taoist scholars of the warring states and later periods. So an example of a diet is the grain-free diet, not eating grains as a way of cultivating your health. And they had also exercises similar to modern Tai Chi, where you're moving very slowly and mindfully in different postures or positions. We know about these practices because of actual texts that have illustrations of the poses. Um, and they're not identical to modern Tai Chi, but they are similar in terms of how they work. So um, in Techniques of the Mind One, this was a text that probably dates to the third or second century BC. And it also presents advice for rulers and that it says if you cultivate yourself in this way through these meditation practices, then you can be effective and respond with tziran or spontaneity as problems arise. So you can see that concept of tziran we see in the earlier Chuang Tzu text, it does get passed into these self-cultivation texts as well. So as inward training theory developed, they developed the notion of san bao or three treasures, jing, qi, shen. So these are a division of the energy of your body into three main parts. Jing is the most material aspect of your vital energy. Um, this could be translated as a vital essence and it's located, its main source or reservoir is in the lower part of your trunk, like in the groin or lower abdomen. The qi is your literal physical breath and the kind of intermediate. So it's a bit more refined than the Jing, um, but not quite as refined and spiritual as Shen. And Qi tends to be located most in the upper abdomen and chest, like where the lungs are. Um, and then Shen is the most refined type of energy and it dwells mainly in the head. Um, and the translation of Shen can be spirit. It also can mean God in a different context. But here it's talking about um, the most refined type of vital energy that you have. The general theory of Taoist self-cultivation has this concept that you are transforming your Jing into a more purified Qi and transforming your Qi into a more purified Shen. So similar in broad outline to the idea of transforming prana in Hinduism, from a coarser or more material state into a more refined state as the, the prana or the kundalini energy ascends the spine to the higher chakras. The details of this system are entirely different, but there's a kind of common theme there. And as far as we know, they were created completely independently of each other. The picture on the right is a much later illustration, but it has the characters for Shen, Qi, and Jing respectively. Uh, within those circles. So those are uh, kind of symbolic depiction of the three treasures. And you see those discussed in many later Taoist self-cultivation texts.